Well, good afternoon, DEC members and guests. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, coming to you from lovely downtown Detroit. I hope you had a terrific summer and you're ready to re-engage with the DEC. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. I always want to take a brief moment to thank the terrific DEC sponsors for their continued support of our mission, and you are seeing them on your screen. And I want to thank you for continuing to support the DEC with your membership. On a programming note, we're ramping up for a busy fall. Some meetings will be virtual, like today's, and some will be in person. In fact, for our next meeting, we'll be in person, October 6th, when we host Senior Economic Advisor Stu Hoffman from PNC Financial Services. And if you've never experienced Stu, you won't be sorry. And we'll have some more announcements soon for some upcoming meetings. You already know how important it is to the DEC that high school and college students are included. And today we wanna to say welcome to students from Eastern Michigan University, Schoolcraft College, Macomb Community College, Osborne High School, and yes, I saved the very best for last, students from that terrific public charter school in Southfield, AGB, AGBU Manugian, brimming with bright Armenian students. So welcome to all of you. The DEC has an incredible history of speakers and our speaker today joins a distinguished list of 15 others who in our 87 year history have addressed the DEC on this day, September 29th. It's an eclectic list and includes different CEOs of AT&T, Michigan's Governor John Engler and the Governor of Idaho, not sure why he would have spoken, but he did, the head of the Chicago Crime Commission in 1958, I'll have to look into that, Coretta Scott King in 1980, and most recently, 2015, the CEO of UPS at the time, David Abney. And today we're pleased to add Daron Asamoglu as our 16th speaker on this day in DEC history. Daron is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at MIT. His academic cr credentials are very impressive. He received a BA in Economics at the University of York and from the London School of Economics, a Master's in Science in Mathematical Economics and Econometrics and a PhD in Economics. In addition to scholarly articles, Daron has published four books, one of which was a New York Times bestseller, and he's among the top 10 most cited economists in the world. And if that isn't enough excitement, we're making DEC history today with the combination of an Armenian speaker and an Armenian moderator, that would be me, with Armenian students in attendance. What a combination. We are so pleased that Daron carved some time for us today from MIT. Let's say hello and welcome Daron to the Detroit Economic Club. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here, Steve. And uh, it's, a, it's a true honor. And I'm here because you promised you're not gonna ask me questions in Armenian. <laughs> I promise. Well, <laughs> the topic, Daron, of our conversation is AI, the future of work and economic prosperity in the age of automation. And we're going to talk about the impact AI is having on jobs and wages. And then you've got ideas for companies and policymakers to mitigate the risk of AI leaving large groups of workers behind. So let's get into it. First question. Earlier this year, Redesigning AI, Work, Democracy, and Justice in the Age of Automation was published by Boston Review. You, Jerome, led off the forum. It was a collaboration of authors from different sectors. Tell us more about the book and the central point you make in your piece. I think the whole book comes out of concerns about what AI will do to society, to work, to democracy, to justice. And there are a lot of things to be concerned about. My entry point here is from the labor market because this is probably the most important institution we have in modern societies where most people make their living and any semblance of shared prosperity has to start from. In this, AI is a continuation of a trend that started with digital technologies and robots, to which, of course, people in Detroit are very familiar, very rapid automation, and not much else in terms of technological investments. And in this way, it 
favors capital and some very skilled workers, engineers, management consultants, CEOs, but is not being very good for you know, regular working people, middle-class Americans. It is in this sense, a broader phenomenon. In particular, you know, when you look at automation, it's not a new phenomenon in the sense that automation didn't start with robots or with AI. British Industrial Revolution, starting in the middle of the 18th century, 1750s, was all about automation, spinning and weaving machines, trying to replace skilled artisans. But when you look at periods in which we've had shared prosperity, such as the three or four decades that followed World War II, automation technologies were counterbalanced and went in hand, called counterbalanced by and went in hand in hand with other technological investments that created new opportunities for workers, that increased human productivity, that provided the basis of a shared prosperity. And that's what we have experienced over the last three, four decades as much less intense investment in those other areas. And again, Detroit, I think, tells the story. It's been the area that has been impacted most by robots and other automation technologies and manufacturing, but there has not been any countervailing investments to create opportunities for people for quite a long time. And that brings you know, benefits for companies, but it doesn't create the sort of uh, the rising tide lifts all boats types of dynamics, which is so critical for middle-class Americans for shared prosperity. And AI, my own research and research by others shows, is going down that same path and it's automating work. And in fact, the emphasis on automation has accelerated with a newfound obsession in the AI community with reaching human parity, trying to replace humans, do better than humans in almost everything. And that I think is a very worrying trend. And that's why you know, my contribution starts with a call for redesigning AI, redesigning digital technologies more broadly away from uh, just automation, trying to create opportunities for people. But it's also important to emphasize it's a broader phenomenon than just work. Work I think is the most important one, but you have to also take into account what's going on with democracy, social media, data collection. I think all of those make an ensemble where technologies are being used at the expense of citizens, at the expense of workers often. And that's part of the call for redesigning it. Thanks, Jerome. We're gonna put the book link in the chat room for anybody that wants to purchase it. It's a really interesting read. And uh, we haven't done this since middle of June. So for our DEC members who may be a little bit rusty, rusty in the final 10 minutes, we're gonna address your questions from the audience. So please use the Q&A function to uh, give us some questions that we'll ask Jerome. So Jerome, you're a member of the steering committee for the AI and Shared Prosperity Initiative, which is led by the Partnership on AI. This initiative aims to make the economic transition induced by AI advancement less burdensome and costly on the part of workers in society. So what burdens and costs are you envisioning and what solutions are out there to ensure that we don't leave workers behind? I think this is a very important question because the first time you raise these concerns with business people, especially researchers and entrepreneurs in AI, their reaction is, you know, you must be a Luddite to oppose AI. And the answer to that is no, you know, I understand the Luddites. The Luddites were worried about all of the hardship that they were suffering because of automation at the time. But that doesn't mean that you have to be a Luddite in the way that we define the word today, which means against technology. So I think recognizing the costly path of AI doesn't mean that we have to be against AI. It means that we have to redirect AI. We have to find better uses for AI. And that's why partnership of AI is central because it is a partnership of some businesses and many researchers and social scientists such as myself trying to find a better way of using that amazing technological platform, not to be against AI, but against the current path of AI. And I think at the center of the solutions that uh, are coming out from the partnership of AI are 
ways of using AI for workers make room for this technology to, to create opportunities for workers. For instance, if you take education, you know, let's not just think of AI replacing teachers via automated grading or automated teaching, but also let's use AI in order to improve the classroom experience, find better ways of creating matches between teachers and students, between adaptive ways of teaching because the teachers recognize what difficulties and what strengths their uh, specific students are having, or same type of things in healthcare. And going beyond work, also ways of using AI so that we empower citizens. We do not use AI for censorship or for companies to collect a huge amount of data and then you know, control what individuals do, but give agency to individuals so they can make decisions. So there's nothing wrong, for example, using AI for better decision-making. So all of us have uh, blind spots, you know, you can, uh, make bad business decisions, bad uh, judicial decisions. But there is something wrong if AI becomes a system of automated decisions, for example, in the judicial system. So there are nuances that we have to get into. And I think partnership of AI is exactly the right type of forum for uh, thinking about these issues. Jerome, very frequently we use taxpayer dollars to compete for high-tech jobs, and then we make grand announcements when they arrive. Here in Detroit, we've got Corktown campus just maybe a half a mile away. Terribly excited about what Ford is doing there. They're focusing on mobility and autonomous vehicles, and we get really excited when they made the announcement that there'll be 5,000 jobs right there. Um, at the Corktown campus. So when we hear those things, how confident should we be in thinking there's a job for me or that that job they take today will still be available for a human in five years? Look, I think that's a great question. And it's a very difficult one to answer. I mean, I think 5,000 jobs in uh, the area of electric vehicles, for example, as Ford is making greater investments, that's fantastic because we need electric vehicles for tackling the climate change challenge. That's a crisis for our generation, absolutely. But on the other hand, you know, what is 5,000 compared to probably over 2 million jobs that have been destroyed due to automation over the last several decades? Now, some of those jobs were bound to be destroyed. It's not that we have to oppose automation, you know, but we have to oppose excessive automation and we have to always say that automation has to go hand in hand with new jobs being created, new opportunities being created. And you know, if you look at Detroit, you know, it's been, you know, the 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 main area of the United States that has suffered as a result of some of this automation. So I think 5,000 jobs is great, but more needs to come. But we also need to have a more holistic thinking. You know, when you are, you know, using taxpayer dollars to incentivize business, that's often is a giveaway to capital. In the United States, for example, we tend to tax capital much less than labor, and for good reason, because capital is very footloose. It can go out of the United States, it can go to Mexico, it can go from Detroit to uh, Cleveland or to, uh, uh, to Phoenix, Arizona. So all of that mobility together with our belief that it's very important to provide subsidies to businesses has meant that there has emerged a huge asymmetry between capital and labor. And that creates a bit of a problem because when we try to encourage investments, that means a lot of subsidies to capital and that tends to increase automation. So I think we have to think about, you know, how can we incentivize also job creation, good jobs for workers. And there, I think your question is exactly right. It's easy to create good jobs for people who have you know, a, a PhD in engineering or artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's easy to create good jobs for people who have graduated from Stanford or, you know, uh, University of Michigan. But how do we create good jobs for people who graduated from community college, which used to be, you know, one of the most important, you know, st stepping stones for middle-class occupations in the United States. So how do we create good jobs for a broader range of skills? I think that's what we have to think about. Tyrone, in this past July in the Washington Post, you wrote about your research with colleagues, which found that firms that increase AI adoption by 1% reduce 
they're hiring by approximately that same 1%. And you wrote in the post, will AI be allowed to work increasingly to displace and monitor humans, or will it be steered towards complementing and augmenting human capabilities, creating new opportunities for workers? Question mark. I'd love for you to expand on that. So what opportunities are there to complement and augment human abilities? You know, I think the issue with current uses of AI is exactly that they are going after this elusive quest for doing things better than humans. And at the end, also not succeeding tremendously. You know, uh, most of us don't like ending up with an automated customer service. Self-checkout ki kiosks don't work so well most of the time. So, you know, we're getting a double whammy from AI. We're replacing workers, but we're not getting much benefit for consumers and we're not getting much productivity gains for businesses. So my proposal is therefore, let's think of AI more holistically. How can we use AI to make workers more productive? I gave an example from education earlier on, but there are plenty of other examples such as from healthcare. Actually manufacturing is an excellent area. Uh, there is great room for AI integrated with vision and virtual reality in order to make workers be able to perform tasks that are much finer, that require much greater precision and work with robots and other advanced machinery. And also there are ways of AI to be used by lower skill workers in order to increase their productivity and adaptability. So I think we have to think about these different uses of AI in order to make work more uh, broadly beneficial for society. And then there are also exactly the same sort of issues when it comes to, for instance, the use of data. You know, AI is, is, is powered by data. But how are we using that data? When you use that data, for example, for a company such as Google or Facebook to just monetize everything on the basis of ads, this is just a very one dimensional use of data. I think we can use data also in ways that to empower people. And again, that requires for us to step back and think about alternative ways of using AI in a socially more productive way. Thanks. Um, a reminder to the members, we want to address your questions. So just use the QA function to uh, enter your question. So Jerome, uh, let's talk about policy. In your opinion, what should policymakers be doing or not doing to help ensure workers share economic prosperity? And talk about both at the federal and state level, if you could. Well, thank you, Steve. Thanks for asking that question. I think it's critical. Unfortunately, there isn't a silver bullet. I think it's a multi-pronged approach that we need. First of all, I think institutional safeguards are important. Uh, you know, we know from a lot of economic research that if you have very heavy handed in interventions in the labor market, they can backfire. But on the other hand, moderate levels of minimum wages and ways of protecting workers have, have worked quite well, both in the US and in Europe. And those things have eroded in the United States. So first of all, bolstering labor market protection for, for workers, I think is an important step. Second, as I pointed out, you know, we have a very asymmetric tax system. And, and redressing that would be useful so that we get rid of the artificial inducements that we have created for people to for, for companies to automate. If you subsidize capital and tax labor, then you're saying to companies, go ahead and automate even more. So for instance, cutting payroll taxes and getting rid of some of the big giveaways to capital, for example, in the form of uh, appreciate, uh, depreciate, you know, accelerated depreciation or a lot of capital in S corporations or private partnerships that are not taxed. So broadening the base rather than increasing marginal tax rates, I think would be one way of going. But also there are other broader uh, considerations we have to take into account. Government research policy, you know, used to be a very autonomous force. If you look at some of the most important advances in sensors, antibiotics, uh, aerospace, uh, internet, computers, you know, all in all of these areas, government had a very important role and also had a leadership role of, of, of channeling dollars and encouraging people to work in that. That stopped. Now government support for research is subservient to a few companies, the big tech companies. And that again, uh, you know, tilts the balance towards, you know, more incremental uh, in investments along the vision of these big tech companies. And finally, I think we also need to step back even further and think about 
what can we do so that a few companies don't become so powerful? And you know, here uh, it's a difficult question because you know there's no doubt that uh, you know companies such as Google, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft have been extremely important, extremely productive, extremely innovative. But on the other hand, they are much more powerful than any company in history, uh, in, in American history has been, even more than Standard and uh, Standard Oil, uh, you know, more than 100 years ago. So how can we re rebalance this? And this is important, not just because of product market power, that's, that's critical, but it's also important for innovation because at the end of the day, AI today is really made out of the image of these few companies and their top executives. And if I am sort of adv advocating an alternative vision of AI, that really requires a rebalancing of power. There's nothing preordained about the path of AI that these companies are taking today. You know, if you look at the early pioneers of machine intelligence, people like Norbert Wiener, uh, uh, Douglas uh, Engelbart, you know, they had a very different view of machine intelligence, much more in line with what I'm advocating, saying that machines have to be useful for people. Machine intelligence is enabling people. And, but I don't think you can get there if these companies rule supreme. So you have to think about this broader, uh, both antitrust and other uh, issues about how to rein in the power of these uh, few companies in the United States today. That's a lot to think about, but really, really interesting. Thank you, Jerome. I wanna turn our attention now to some audience questions. Some were emailed to us and let me just start with a question from DEC member Stephanie. Is there an ethical case for not building certain forms of AI in the first place? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's only in this, in our age of techno optimism meets techno obsession, that we somehow think that anything that can be built technically should be built. But, you know, researchers and, uh, and, and social commentators have long understood that that's not necessarily something you want to do. We do not want, you know, it would have, the world would have been better if nobody built nuclear weapons. So that's the technically feasible thing that we are worse off for having built. You know, biologists understood more than 30 years ago that there will be capabilities developing uh, uh, about gene editing and, uh, and, 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 and manipulating human genome that they shouldn't do and they signed a pledge for not doing so. So again, that's another area where technologically things are feasible, but we may not wanna do it. And I think in the case of AI, if you build machines that provide, for example, the ability for governments to completely stamp out all opposition and know uh, everything that people are doing without any regards to privacy, I think that is a very dangerous weapon. So the uh, extreme facial recognition capabilities that are being developed and used, for example, in China, I think the world would be quite, quite a better bit of a better place if we didn't invest so much in them. And so I think there are also related issues in data collection. If we have the capabilities for collecting data without individual consent, that also creates a lot of problems. So I think in every case, we have to ask this question. Yes, it's technically feasible, but is that really for society's good? And for that, we need, of course, some ethical guidelines, principles, and analysis to be able to do that. Let's stay on that theme because another member um, wrote, uh, Derek said, uh, you write that AI might undermine democracy and individual freedoms. You just talked about individual freedoms. What about undermining democracy? How so? Well, I think uh, democracy, of course, is a very complex institution. And I don't wanna blame AI for democracy's woes, but Democratic institutions haven't been doing well over the last 15 years. You know, uh, from the 1980s to the mid 2000s, we had a wave of more and more countries becoming democratic and democratic countries strengthening their institutions. That's been in complete reversal for the last 16 years. It's, that has many causes, but I think three factors related to AI and automation are playing a role as well. The first one is inequality. If you increase inequality and make some citizens irrelevant in the labor market, that's going to 
add discontent, it's going to pacify some elements and it's going to anger others. And it's going to lead to the polarization dynamics that we have seen so well in the United States. Second, social media. I think today there is broad agreement that the current model of social media as exercised by Facebook and Twitter based on content, uh, choosing content in order to maximize engagement has been bad for democratic discourse. How bad, you know, there's a debate on that. Is that a major element or only a secondary element? It's, 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 it's something we have to investigate more, but it's certainly not been good for democracy. And third, you know, it's empowering governments at the expense of the citizens. You know, uh, in the US, perhaps we can hope we have ways of checking what the NSA is going to do. Uh, and if anybody else against tries something like what Nixon tried to do with much better tools uh, and powered by AI, perhaps we have a way of checking that. I don't know. But certainly there seems to be no way of checking that in Russia or Belarus or Iran or China and, uh, and many other developing countries with authoritarian regimes are imitating these, uh, these, these, these dictatorships. So, and that again, AI is contributing to that. We probably just have time for one question, and I think it's an important one, Daron, and it comes from one of the students that has joined us. And um, the student asks, if you were a high school or college student today, how should we factor AI in our career aspirations and navigation? That's a fantastic question. And again, there isn't a perfect answer because we don't know where AI is going to go. We don't know where all other things are going to go. We are in a fast changing world. But as a general lesson, what we know is that people tend to do better when they develop skills that are complementary to the technologies that are developing rather than substitutes. So what I mean by that is that if you are thinking of investing in you know, financial accounting, you know, that's probably a good occupation for the 2000s and 2010s, but not probably for the 2020s, because that's one of the applications of AI that's, uh, that's very rapidly evolving. So the, what accountants do, I, I don't think accountants are going to disappear, but what accountants do is going to change a lot. So, but if you invest in skills that are going to work alongside AI or perhaps be amplified by AI, and of course their IT skills is part of it, social skills, teamwork, uh, communication, I think are skills that we certainly don't think the current AI capabilities are going to crack anytime soon. I think those are more likely to be amplified by AI. But on the other hand, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, so if you, Some experts think that progress in AI is going to be so rapid in the next two decades that we're going to reach singularity and uh, boundless, uh, 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 boundless uh, riches in, in, in a decade or two. I mean, I don't think that's right. I think that's way too optimistic, but, but there's a lot of disagreement about where AI is going to go and what occupations are going to be affected by AI. Let's wrap up with a really important question. Favorite Armenian food? Uh, dolma. I oh, cannot, topic. Sorry, sorry, topic or dolma, I don't know which one. I cannot yeah. argue with that. Well, a huge thank you to Jerome for spending time with the DEC. Good luck to you. We wish you the best. Let us know if we can be helpful here in Detroit, and maybe next time we can do this with you in person. Thank you. Thank Jerome. you very much, Steve. It was really a pleasure to be able to join you, albeit remotely, and good luck with everything. And I look forward to visiting the beautiful city of Detroit sometime soon. That's very kind. Thank you. And thank you to Team Jerome and to my team, and for all of you for continuing to support the DEC. Your membership is very important to us. So finish the week strong, stay healthy, and hope to see you in person next week when we host Stuart Huffman. On time, every time. Have a great day, everybody. Goodbye.